It's the nation's favourite antiques experts. I think I found something. Pretty good, yeah. Behind the wheel of a classic car. Oh, stop it. And a go. Scar Britain for antiques. Ooh, I think it's brilliant. The aim? To make the biggest <laughs> profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. You're some man. There'll be worthy winners and valiant losers. <laughs> oh. Will it be the high road to glory? Yeah, baby. Or the slow oh. road to disaster? Oh, oh. This is the disaster. antiques road trip. <laughs> yeah, baby. We're clocking up the miles with our peripatetic experts, Louise Gostolo <laughs> and David Harper, as we head into a new county on this epic trip. Where are we? Wales. That's where. Borada. Oh, Borada to you too. Oh, you know what it means. Good morning. Does it? I, just, I didn't know. I just heard someone say it earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, what other Welsh do you know then? That's it. Board smoothie. -o. Board smoothie. -o. Yes. Is that a compliment? It's a good one for you. Ironing board. <laughs> Oh, you talk about my stomach. <laughs> now that's going to come in so handy later on. It all went very well for our pair last time out, with Louise picking up a little dancing buddy. I've fallen in love with this little fella. And the bidders went ape for us. You are on fire. David opted for a more familiar furry friend. Oh no, not another dog, please. And he ran away at the auction. Dogs seem to be doing very well for you. Oh, actually, that's my plan. More dogs. Maybe we should try cats. Could we change our allegiance? Oh, controversial, eh? Louise started this trip with £200, and after a few doggy deals of her own, she's increased that to £226.32. But David, who started with the same amount, now has a bit of a lead, with £289.70p to spend this time out. So I've just picked again, haven't I? You have. That's another Welsh word, picked, meaning leaping forward, succeeding, being the winner. Meaning, would you like to get out now? <laughs> Luckily, there's no ejector seat in their VW Beetle Cabriolet, but it does bring back happy childhood memories for our man. I remember watching the old Herbie films. Oh, gosh, how embarrassing. No. OK, Herbie, number 53. The Beetle. The talking Beetle. I'm going to invite you round to my house. I'm going to put a DVD on of Herbie. And you're going to have a night to remember, Louise. <laughs> now, there's an offer you can't refuse. So far on this trip, they've steered their love bug all around Northern Ireland, and they've taken in the northwest of England. It's now time for a jaunt around North Wales before heading east to a final auction in Scarborough. On this leg, we'll be auctioning in England at Liverpool. But let's make a start in the Welsh market town of Abagella, where, down at the beach, there have been sightings of Prince Maddox's ghost ship. According to folklore, he sailed to America some 300 years before Columbus. Time for David's voyage of discovery to begin. Have a smashing day. Bye. Bye bye. What wonders will await him in Aladdin's cave? Well, hey, I come to the right place. Are you Keith? I am indeed. Oh, Keith, how oh, are you fixing? You're fixing boots. I am fixing boots. Is this meant to be an antique shop? It is an antique shop. Well, what are you doing fixing boots? Shoe repairs, watch repairs, clock repairs, and antiques. Blimey, talk about diversifying. OK, well, I'll have a route around and I shall give you a shout. Okie dokie. Thank you. Keith's shop has it all. Some antique things, some not so antique. But an enterprising expert with a keen eye should be able to find a diamond here in the rough. You can buy a pair of work boots, a plug-in electric fire, which I probably wouldn't plug in, and a bicycle. It's just full of stuff. But some stuff is better than others. This little thing here is quite possibly one of the most perfect items I could ever wish to buy on the Antiques Road Trip. Let's have a look at it. Austin, you can depend on it. So this is the Austin Motor Company of Longbridge, Birmingham. It looks incredibly Art Deco, but it isn't. I know for certain it's early 1950s. If you go and buy a brand new Austin in 1950 to 1952, you would be given one of these little games to give to the kids to sit in the back of the car to keep them quiet. It's in absolutely mint condition with its box. And I know that it spells something very specific. 
and I'm going to just have a go, try and work this out for you. Talk amongst yourselves, and this might take a while. If you have a very clever child in the back of the car, they will be able to eventually work this out, and it will spell Austin of England. But here comes the most interesting part. I have seen one of these in the V&A Museum in London. This is a very rare little freebie. And at £25, it's not going to break the bank either. So if that is good enough for the V&A, it's good enough for me. Very nice find, Mr Harper. Now, on the subject of motors, Louise has pointed hers towards the town of Denby, home of her first shop of the day, Denbyshire Antiques. A big old warehouse full of antique lovelies. Is hoping there's something to Louise's taste in here. Some of the fine furniture, perhaps. So do you know what this is? 19th century child's commode, toilet. So what you'd do, you'd have little Johnny, little Bertie, you'd pop them on the chair. There'd probably be a little bar that went across here to keep them in. So there'd probably be a porcelain pot underneath. And off they would go. Delightful. I don't think they're necessarily aimed at children of the 21st century. But a talking piece, nonetheless. Your dinner parties must be fascinating. <laughs> does have a bonus feature, however. It's metamorphic. So, if you do that, this bit hinges up. But then, twist that under there. Make sure you take the potty out first, eh? <laughs> Et voila! Child's play table. It's a quirky little thing. I like the metamorphic aspect of it. Makes it slightly more appealing. Well, while you ponder that, is there anything a bit less lavatorial to take your fancy? I've seen quite a few of these dotted around. They're sort of, I don't know, 1950s, 60s retro. No maker's mark, but quite a lot of chewing gum. These have probably come from a school, maybe a science lab or something like that. But, do you know what? I think these could look pretty good in a kitchen. Set of four of them around a kitchen table. Yeah, I think these could have potential at auction. They're stackable too. No price on those either, but her seating plan is certainly coming together. <laughs> Back at the shoe repairers, though, David's still sorting the wheat from the chaff. Right, now then, what do we need? Do we need some elastic? Some curlers? Well, I don't need the curlers. Glasses. Oh, cool. John Lennon glasses. We're going to Liverpool, guys. So we've got nine carat gold. Very posh. They are cool dudes. These are quite stylish, and I'm going to try them on. Right, let's have a look. Oh, yes. Seem to fit absolutely perfectly. Oh, yeah. Don't look like a beetle. Dung, perhaps. I can't see out of them. I mean, I've got quite bad eyesight, but whoever owned these originally couldn't see at all. Now, here is where the problems begin. On this side, nine carat up to there, but then it's been snapped at some point, and you have a piece of copper that's been welded on that, I'm afraid. Kills them dead. People would pay 50, 60, 70 pounds for glasses like this from the 30s and 50s in good order, but with a break like that, it's a fiver's worth. That's a shame, but never mind, as you still have your museum piece puzzle to consider. Keith, I am taking no deal off the table. I am leaving today with that item. What is your very best price? To you, sir, 20 quid. Right, OK, well, that seemed to work out a bit better than I thought, but that's great, I'll have it. And with just under £270 left, David's a happy bunny. Great to meet you. And you, sir. Well, that wasn't cobblers after all. In fact, you might say it was good for the soul. <laughs> Back in Denby, Louise has moved on from all those chairs to more weighty matters. It's a cannonball. The first examples came about around about mid-15th century. Early ones were made of stone. This one is made of cast iron. Imagine the destruction that would do if that came hurtling through the side of a ship, wood splintering everywhere. Dropping it on your foot would be no joke either. Are people going to want to buy a cannonball? Well, I want to buy a cannonball, so on that theory, I'm going to say yes. Just like those chairs earlier, there's no price on it. You'll need someone in the know. Hello, Paul. Hello. Right, OK. I'm going to put that down there, because that's quite heavy. Can I make you a cheeky offer for three things that I've seen? Uh, we'll try. Go on, right. 
Can you guess? Cannonball is the first one. Child's commode metamorphic table and four of these stools. Can I offer you £100 for them? 140 I can do. Say 120 then. 120, Go on. 120, nice one, Paul. Lovely. And we get you some money before you change your mind. So that's £60 for the cannon ball and 30 each for the set of stools and the commode. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Right. I'm off. And after that haul, she's got about £107 left. That's going to make an almighty clock as you turn a corner, you know. Listen to that. Bang. <laughs> Now, it's a sweeter sound that has drawn David away from his shopping. He's travelled up the coast to the seaside resort of Llandidno, lured by the strains of the Colwyn male voice choir. This choir can trace its roots to the 1890s, but the tradition of Welsh male choirs stretches back for centuries. Huel Roberts, vice chairman and first tenor, can explain why Wales is justly known as the land of song. It has been for centuries the Welsh uh, poetry, the singing, the uh, bardic influence of, of the Welsh culture, uh, and that's how it's built from the start, really. The way it was formed with families and, and communities, they used to go to each other's houses and they'd have uh, singing competitions and different types of things. So very local, but international as well. Any big festivals? Yes, there's big, big festivals. The first festival was put together in 1176 down in South Wales, in Cardigan Castle, where there were different competitions in singing and poetry, and the person who came top had a chair at the King's Castle. Oh, I see, so that was the prize. Not dissimilar, then, to Saturday Night TV singing competitions. Known as Eisteddfuds, these grand celebrations of Welsh culture sadly went into decline over the centuries, with only informal gatherings in taverns keeping the traditions alive. But the Welsh love of song found a new outlet in the 18th century with the rapid growth of Methodism in Wales. Over a third of the population were, were categorised as, or they classified themselves as Methodists. A lot of them turned their back on the Anglican faith and a big part of that was the Welsh singing and the growing of the Welsh community, so it was a huge, huge part. Still is today? Still is today. There's a lot of, of chapels and churches that are still very strong in certain areas. And any notable characters? The big revival in the 18th century was William Williams of Pantakelin, a prolific writer of Welsh songs, and the one he's well known for is Guide Me Over the Great Jehovah which is well known as the bread of heaven. Go on, give us a blast. <laughs> I can't remember how it starts. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like being put on the spot, eh, Huel? Guide me, O oh, the great redeemer, pilgrim to this barren land. And on it goes. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Outside the chapels, the growth of heavy industry in the 18th and 19th centuries played a massive part in the story of Welsh song. In mines, quarries and steelworks all across Wales, male voice choirs sprang up as a way for people to come together as a community. It was a big release for them. It sort of took them away from their, their grind and their, their hard, hard, hard work because uh, what they, they endured at those times were, was, was horrendous. But uh, they found solace in singing and they forgot about their day-to-day -day lives. It's a bit folk-like as well then, isn't it? Yes, it's, it is quite folk-like. Um, a, a lot of people, the workers, used to write songs about what their work. Uh, there's a well-known song, it's called the Chwarelur, which is, is the quarryman. He was in a confined space, darkness, with just a candle, and the song goes on about wanting to see the sun and see the daylight. The growth of these choirs coincided with a revival in Welsh culture. The tradition of the Eisteddfod was re-established during the 19th century and has gone from strength to strength, with choirs from all across Wales and beyond taking part. And when they're not competing, the men of Colwyn are much in demand, with very good reason. Marvellous. Now, let's catch up with Louise, heading to her next shop just down the road in Landudno Junction. And you might guess from the name, the town grew up because of the railways. Good view of the neighbours in Conway, too. 
Very posh houses, eh? Louise has come to college and co to see what they have in store. Some very nice things, that's what. Beautifully presented, but with price tags to match. Given that her funds are down to about £100, she's going to need her sensible head on in here. So this beast of a pipe, it's Victorian. It's probably Nelsie glass or some factory like that. Now, I always thought that they were uh, tobacconist advertising pieces. But apparently, they can be used as bubble pipes. All right, maybe not so sensible. <laughs> Let's give it a go. It certainly bubbles, doesn't it? I hope you're going to mop it up when you've finished. Hours of fun. And the purpose of your visit, Louise? Buying stuff for the auction? Remember that? Ah, oh, this is more like it. I really like the look of these. They're crystalliums. They are a form of print. And they're dogs again. Well, it worked for David last time, didn't it? So crystalliums are very much a Victorian thing. The print would be laid on the back of the convex glass, then it would be peeled off, hand-painted, and then backed with another piece of glass. The chances are the images are by somebody like Arthur Wardle or Thomas Blinks, those great Victorian dog artists. There's one dilemma with these, and this is why I've always been put off from buying them in the past. One crack, and they're pretty much worthless. But I like them. I like the fact that they're dogs. There's no price on them. This is a gamble. If we were going to a rural sale room, I, do you know what? I wouldn't bat an eyelid and I'd have them. Will the people of Liverpool like them? Only one way to find out. Let's consult with our friendly proprietor, Nick. Right. Yep. Can I make you a cheeky offer? You can. Can I offer you £60 for them? Probably have to take £90 for them. <gasps> can we compromise? Can we say 75 80 pounds. 80 quid. Go on then. 80 pounds. She's burning through the cash today, isn't she? Only 26 pounds and 32 pence left for tomorrow. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Let's go. And with that, there's just time to pop up the road and catch the matinee performance featuring the debut of one familiar looking chorister. My, this is my groupie! My groupie! <laughs> <laughs> I've only got one! <laughs> Do you think this singing lark might have gone to his head? <laughs> Nighty night. As day breaks, our one man Welsh male voice choir is still at it. Feed me now and evermore! evermore. Feed That's the only bit of that song I know as well. Oh, joy. Yesterday, our songbird was a bit tardy with his purchasing, spending only £20 on a bit of Austin ephemera. That is good enough for the V&A. It's good enough for me. So, he still has £269 and change for today's shopping. At the other extreme, Louise only has a little over £26 left after blowing £200 on a commode, some stools... No maker's mark, but quite a lot of chewing gum. ..a pair of Christolian pictures and something with a bit of heft. I bought a cannonball, David! A cannonball? A cannonball. From which period? A long time ago. <laughs> what did you pay for the daft cannonball? <clears throat> £50. Did you say 50 Oh, I just said 60. Are you off your trolley? Yeah, OK, I How know. How many cannonballs do you think were ever produced? Yeah, but they're long gone. I've got 14 in my garden. Oh, you would have. People throwing them at me. <laughs> do you know, I can well believe that. Later, we'll be crossing into England for an auction in Liverpool, but we start today in the town of Mould, where, in 1833, workmen discovered a body wrapped in an exquisite solid gold cape which dated back to the Bronze Age. And hoping for treasure trove of his own, David's arriving at Jennings Antiques, housed in this fabulous old garage. Someone's nicked your parking spot, David. <laughs> Check that out, the front there on the grill. Austin. Very appropriate, bear in mind, 
I bought the Austin giveaway game yesterday, but this is an Austin 7. Not for sale, David, and wildly outside your £270 budget, if it was. Have a butcher's inside, though. I think this might be right up your alley. You know, if I could describe a place as my natural environment, this must be it. I've been saying on this trip that I'd like to try and find items that I can't value, maybe pieces I haven't seen before, and this is the place to do it. Told you you'd like it. Come on, the David, surprise us. This mask is something that I would always be drawn to, but be a little afraid of, not because he's scary looking. These things are scary because I don't know exactly where it was made, really when it was made, why it was made, what tribe. It's all incredibly involved, but he's just so decorative. So, let me tell you what I do know about this mask. Almost nothing. How's that for expert analysis, then? I think he's Eastern. I don't think he's African. Now, the question you've got to ask yourself is this. Is it a clever reproduction or is it the real deal? I'm going to say he's real because look at his nose. The wear on his nose is lovely. So it's a soft wood carved and then he's covered in some kind of gesso, which is a, a plaster, and then painted. Look at the back. Lots of wear, lots of chipping. That's about 100 years old. He's 30 quid. I don't know nearly enough about that, but I fancy taking a punt. But I can't tell you exactly where it's from, who made it, why, what, where and when. Who cares? We're all going to go on a learning journey there. Well, he said he was going out of his comfort zone. What else? Wowza! That's a heavy instrument. It must be maritime, I'm guessing. 60 quid, no description. It's obviously for measuring something, maybe the balance of the listing of a boat. So, black and brass, very 19th century in its decoration. Very heavy, fantastically constructed, great big brass bolt there, a big thread. I would date that to about 1819, 1910, pre-First World War. And now we're going to Liverpool. They're bound to love anything to do with ships, I would have thought. So a maritime thing like that would be very interesting. I might have a go at that. So that's speculative item number two. He's really leaning into this now. OK. I know I'm trying to find things that I don't understand, but I can't help myself. I've loved wooden boxes since I was a very young boy. Just look at that. Let's have a look inside. Oh, my goodness me. Ladies and gentlemen, mystery object number three. What on earth is that? It's obviously some kind of industrial measuring equipment. Look at that. Oh, my gosh. A miniature ruler. So this is quite a precise measuring instrument. There's the maker. Hughes and Lancaster engineers and contractors. That is absolutely beautiful. Now, what is that for? I've absolutely no idea but it is completely charming. It's £55, and I adore it. So the combined price of that engineering thingamajig, the mask thingamajig, and the ship's inktinometer thingamajig is £145. Let's see if Rob, the proprietor, can fill us in at all. That is a, uh, a steam engine testing instrument. Right. I date that to, like, late 19th, early 20th I think, century. I think so, yeah. yeah. OK, I'm just thinking aloud. It's 55 quid. Yeah. Can I make you a bid? You can make me a bid, yes. OK, bear in mind, I don't know really what it is, what it's worth, 30. Right, that's a very low bid. It's a low bid, but yeah. I don't know anything about it. Okay. So I can get away with that, can't I? I very much doubt it. What about the rest? You've got a mask, the yellow mask. Yeah, and um, what else were you interested in? Oh, the maritime thing. Yeah, the angle of list measure. Angle of list. Will you do 100 on the three? I'm doing you a good deal there. Yeah, I'll have a go at that. OK. Thank you very much. So, 20 for the mask and 40 each for the unusual instruments, leaving our man with just under £170 and not a clue as to what he's actually just bought. Well, it'll make for an interesting auction. No stopping for Louise, though, just yet. She's come to Wrexham, North Wales's largest town, for a taste of one of its most successful and quite continental exports. How do you do? Hello, Vaughan. Nice She's meeting you. brewer Vaughan Roberts to find out how the town became the first place in the British Isles to produce lager. Where did lager originate from? 
Bavaria, um, Pilsen, um, and then obviously Germany. Um, there's a large history of it over there. Unlike ale, lager needs to be kept cold during fermentation. Traditionally, the Bavarian brewers would store it in caves and cellars packed with river ice. So it's all about the temperature? It's all about temperature on fermentation, yes. It's controlling the temperature of the fermentation and then storing the lager in really cold conditions. Because lager means store in German, so that's where it comes from. Lager began to be imported to Britain by the mid-19th century, but it was incredibly expensive. So, in 1881, two German expat businessmen, Ivan Levinstein and Otto Isler, decided to try to make taste of home on British soil. And thanks to its abundant supply of good quality water, Wrexham was the ideal location. They tried to ferment it by digging into the hillside and used the cool underground facility that was there, but it was not cold enough. They weren't able to achieve those temperatures, so it would have been bitter aftertastes and everything else. So would it have been a darker? It would have been room. darker, it would have been cloudier. Um, it wouldn't have been anything like, you know... Just not nice. ..like your full beer <laughs> today, no, no. Their business was failing when fellow German Robert Gresser, a chemicals manufacturer, bought a controlling share of the company and provided the means to regulate the lager's temperature. He introduced mechanical refrigeration and knew that he could achieve the temperatures that were needed rather than relying on nature. So he had faith in it and followed it through. Although the brewing process had been perfected, the drinkers of Wrexham were having none of it, preferring to stick with the traditional ale brewed by the numerous other breweries in the town. On the verge of bankruptcy, Wrexham Lager needed to find a new market. Gressa went on a ship to America and it hit a storm and all the ale on board turned. Whereas he had his, he taken his own lager with him for consumption uh -huh. and it was perfect. So after that it became popular on cruise liners for export, the armed forces took it on for the troops and then it was exported all around the world. Give me a sense of just how famous Wrexham Lager became around the world. Well, it was exported to many countries under different brands. Australia was one of the first lagers there, or the first maybe, under the Kangaroo brand it was called. And then there was Elephant Beer, which went out to Africa. It was exported to India. It was exported to many, many countries. In spite of the drink's success abroad, the pubs of Wrexham were still reluctant to place orders. So, in 1922, the company decided to play the publicans at their own game. Wrexham Lager purchased its first pub, um, the Cross Foxes. Um, it was very popular. The lager really took off there. They sold it through a dispense system that had lead boxes packed with ice, and then the beer ran through it and it chilled it prior to dispense and it really did take off, and it did massive business there. So was it sort of the first genuinely ice-cold beer then? It really was, yes. The local brewery closed and had an estate of pubs, 23 and all. Uh, Wrexham Lager purchased that estate, uh, put lager in every one of its pubs. Sadly, though, down the years, the influence of Britain's first lager dwindled as more competitors entered the market and imported lager became much cheaper. In 2002, Wrexham Lager finally went out of production. But now it's back, thanks to Vaughan and his family, who resurrected the brand in 2010 using one of the original recipes. Time for some quality control, I think, don't you? Cheers. Yakida. Yakida. Absolutely delicious. Meanwhile, David is crossing over the border into England and heading to the village of Tatton Hall. Applegate's Antiques is his destination, but he'd better back up because a certain Ms Gostelow will be here shortly. Hello. Oh, hi. I'm David. Hi, David. I'm Jackie. Hello, Jackie. This is fantastic. You like it? I do. Do you give me massive discounts if I shout? Is that what happens? If you smile, I'll give you a nice discount. Nice discount. OK, I'll do lots of smiling. Fab. So, with grin fixed firmly in place, let's go shopping. And our boy is bypassing all the nice things inside and heading straight out to the yard. Anything of interest here, David? I can't help but be drawn to wood. Look at that wood. I know it's just a bog-standard planter, but look at the colour of that timber. It's teak, it's rich, it's red. 
It's glorious. It's so well made. It's got a maker's mark. They often have maker's marks. Let's have a look. Oh, wow. Hang on a moment. <sighs> From the HMS Terrible. Well, obviously, a, a Royal Navy battleship. Indeed, it was the guns from the cruiser saw action in the relief of Lady Smith during the Boer War. So when she was scrapped, the timbers were taken and recycled into fabulous pieces of furniture. Just think of the life those teak panels have experienced. I think that is absolutely fantastic. You're not going to believe this. I'm going to show you the price ticket. Four whole great British pounds for a great piece of British handmade furniture from the British warship, HMS Terrible. That is not terrible, that is fabulous. Where is Jackie? Jackie, have you seen this? Oh, it's lovely. Isn't it gorgeous? And it's bonkers, it's four quid. What a bargain. I know. What do we do with that? Well, we can't go any lower. I don't want to pay £4 for it. Would you, Jackie, take £5? That would be fabulous. Okay. Thank you, David. My pleasure. Five great British pounds coming your way. He's such a generous soul, isn't he? And he's got over £160 left in his pocket. Right, time to yield the floor to your less well-off rival. She's pitching up with a mere £26.32. Uh-oh, where's she off to? What are you doing in here? I'm resting because I deserve it. Oh, resting, is that what you call yes, it? Yes, I do, being very lazy in a very nice warm caravan. But if you cross his palm with silver, he'll still read your tea leaves. Ah. Have you done your shopping for the day, done then? everything. I'm just waiting for you. All right, I'm off. Well, there's plenty to look at. David hasn't even touched the stuff inside. Look at this. Do you know what it is? I'm no expert, but I, I'd say it's a post box. If I turn it over, there's a big clue. It's a match striker underneath it. So, if I press this... The button seems to have long since departed. Right, if I press this and gently open the top as well... Ha-ha! There we go. Matches. So this would be a Vesta case. You'd put your matches in there, you'd strike them underneath and snap your match at the same time. Didn't your mother tell you ever not to play with them? I just think this is really cute. Little novelty Vesta case. OK, £42 is its ticket price. I haven't got £42. I'm going to have to have a word with Jackie. Cross my fingers. Don't forget to smile. Right, Jackie, I'm afraid it's cheeky offer time. OK. The ticket price is £42, and the only money that I have left is £26.32. So I'm really hoping you're going to say that it's been sat on the shelf for ages and it needs to be sold. Bless. <laughs> yes, I'm going for the sympathy vote. Go on, Louise, you can have it. <gasps> Jackie, thank you so much. £26.32 pounds and 32 pence it Lovely. is. Lovely. Let me find you some money. So, as she offloads the last of her shrapnel, I'd say our work here is done. Time indeed to get on the road once more for that command performance at the auction. I need to do my vocal warm-ups. Oh, not again. How long will it take to get to Liverpool? Oh. Hour or so? Oh, gosh. Oh, give me time. Oh, I'll have no. half an hour warm-up. Oh. Let me out, let me out. It's going to be a long journey before they get some shut-eye. Welcome to Liverpool, a city of innovation. The world's first integrated sewer system was built here, and it was the birthplace of the football net. <laughs> Let's hope there's a few in the back of the goal for our two in the cell room today. I always think of Liverpool as being a very lucky city. Whoa! Fingers crossed then, eh? I'm feeling lucky, baby. Right on. After a whistle-stop tour, the antique shops in North Wales, they've alighted on the banks of the Mersey, here to sell their wares at Cato Crane Auctioneers, in the room and online too. David shopped canny, spending only £125 on his five auction lots, none of which he knows anything about. This worries me. To begin with, I couldn't understand why, when the lady was asking £4 for it, David gave her £5. In here, is a little label that says, from the teak of HMS Terrible. 
Five pounds paid, it's got to be a profit at auction. Louise blew her whole budget, £226.32 p on her five lots. Well, would you look at that? A child's metamorphic high chair stroke commode. But I've sold many of these things over the years, but what they buy them for is for teddy bears, for real, living, breathing children, probably described as a health hazard. Don't mince your words, David. Let's find out if John Crane, the man with the golden gavel, has anything more edifying to say about their lots. An Austin puzzle game. I have seen one of these before, but they're not commonplace. I think for, for people who collect Austin cars, you, it'd be great to have one of these on your dashboard. And, uh, yeah, I think it's a nice thing. I think I would buy it. An iron cannonball. It is what it is, isn't it? Can't think of much use for it apart from a paperweight on your desk or if you've got a cannon and you don't like your neighbours. Especially if your neighbour is David, apparently. Right, we've saved you some good seats down at the front. Oh, hang on a minute. Lovely. Seems a bit dodgy. You're all right as long as you stay sitting still. Comfy? Then let's begin with Louise's Christolian hunting dog pictures. £18 is bid here. 18 that's a bit low. £20, are you coming in? 20 mm. It's bid in the room now, 22 mm. 22 is on the net, 24 with you, 26 on the net, 28, thank you sir, 30 on the net, 32, keep it going, 32, 34, 36. Look, I'll put the £2 towards it. <laughs> That's one way of getting the bidding going. 38, 40, 40 is bid, 42, 40 pounds in the room standing then. It could have been worse. They could, they could have been 20 quid, couldn't they? They could have been. I think pooch-related items might be starting to lose their charm. Say, I'm off dogs. Oh, you could never be off dogs. How many dogs have you got? Four. Exactly. <laughs> Next up, David's museum piece, his Austin puzzle. This is one of my all-time favourite purchases on any series of the Antiques Road Trip. 18 is bid right away, 18. 20 is bid. Do you want 22? £22 is bid. <laughs> 22 Go is the best we can do now. No. Very, very rare object. 22 24 is now bid. Well, 24 Well, ladies and gentlemen... We I'm want another museum. Pounds. No further bid. £24. Well, there you go. There you go. But I enjoyed the buying. Well, there you go. So it didn't matter. And it did make you a teeny bit of profit. If that ends up in another museum... Potty time now. Louise's metamorphic commode. Useful. Oh, OK. If you were a Victorian child. <laughs> 20 is bid. 20. Thank you. Gosh, oh, got you in. 20 pounds. 22. 22. 24. 24 pounds. That's the best Someone thing. Someone must have a small Oof. child. Pounds. It's got to go. <laughs> Obviously, no Victorian parents in the room. I think we've, we have totally got this wrong. <laughs> we have. <laughs> Well, there's bound to be a lot of demand for David's steam engine testing thingamabob. £20 is bid right away. £20. £22. £24 is bid on the Come internet. On. £24. Are we winning? £24. No. £26. <laughs> £26, anyone? Long way to go, yeah. £26 down there, Come yeah. On. 28 is on the net now. 30 is you, sir. 32 on the net now. 32, 34. One more. Go on. 34. 34. 36 on the net now. 36 pounds. OK, all done and finished at 36 pounds now. The four pounds I made on the thing I knew about, yeah. I've just lost four pounds on the thing I didn't know anything about. Swings and roundabouts, David. So the thing in me, Bob, wasn't necessarily a great success. No, I'm not going to be doing any more of those things in me, Bob, so I can tell you that for nothing. This is a bit more recognisable. Louise's novelty Vesta case. 32. 34, anyone. 34. Two bidders, 34. Oh, 34 is good. Bid. Oh, genuinely good. We're asking 36 is bid. 38 is now bid. I love it. Oh. I really love 38. it. 38. So anybody in the room? We're all done at 38. You know what? Well done. Thank you. Well done. Strike a light, eh? Her first profit of the day. My faith is restored. Good for you. Another of David's mystery objects, the mask of unknown origin. It reminded me of you, funny enough. Thanks. Yeah, it's a pleasure. £20 is bid. Do you want 22 on the net? 22 is bid. 24 is bid on the net oh, now. Come on. 24, 26 is bid. 28 is bid. 28. One. Is it 30? Come on, one more. 30 one. is bid. 32 is bid. I think we're going to sell at £32 now. 
It's my best oh, result. That's what I didn't really know very much about. <laughs> well, it looks like someone certainly did. It's a win. It's a win, I'll take it. Now, who's in the market for some cool school stools? Chewing gum thrown in for free. £20 is bid, 20, 22. 24 is bid now, 24, 26 anywhere. Well, done at 24, mm. that's what the bidding's gone up to. What can I say? What can I say? I'm getting good at making a loss. <laughs> there was a distinct lack of chemistry there. You know when you just want the ground to open up and swallow you? Always remember, you're a winner. <laughs> will that positive attitude help David's £5 planter, or will it be terrible? £20. I've got... That's terrible. Make it 25 on the net, please. It's terrible. 25. Do you want 30? 35. This is more like it. 40 is bid. 45. Go on. 45 on the net. £50 is bid. Right, 50. 50. I'm going to sell at £50 now. Hmm. Terrible. Terrible. It's terrible. Terrible. It's terrible for me. What can I say? It's terrible. Just be thankful he didn't get one from HMS Fabulous. <sighs> Go on. Well, if you last lot bombs, Louise, you know who you can throw it at. 55 is bid. Oh, not bad. 55 is bid for the cannonball. Bit more, bit more, bit more. Yeah, I'm, look, I'm doing my best, you know. I'm in charge. Uh, <laughs> you tell them, John. £60 is bid now, 60 Make it 65 anybody. Go! 65 anybody. 65, 65, 65, the gentleman standing right in front of me is 65. It's a good job I didn't make a prediction. Room. £65. All done. £65. I am seriously impressed with that. He's going home to dig out the ones in his garden now. Well, that was lucky, wasn't it? No, no. I think it was your skill. <laughs> I do, I do. David's last lot now. He's got a little list. £20 here, 25 30 Go on. 35 with you, sir. 35 on the net now. 40 is with you standing. Go on. Angle of list, angle of list. 40 is your bid. Go on. 45 here on the net. Would you like 50? Go on, sir. 50 is bid. £50, your bid. Make no mistake. 55 just oh, in time. Oh, 50 is even better. Would you like 60? Go on, sir. Would you like... You love, would you love 60. <laughs> would you like 57, then? Come on. 57 is bid. Gentleman in the room here, 57 pounds. Yeah. OK. 57. Well done. 17 pounds more, Jim, that's OK. Yes, he's been on an even keel today. Should we go and talk about maritime objects? Come on. You two sling your hook while I tie up some loose ends. <laughs> Louise was all at sea today, making quite a loss. So, after sailing fees, she now has a mere £156.62 for our next voyage. But it was plain sailing for David as he steered his way to a healthy profit. After auction costs, he now has £327.88 in his coffers and quite a commanding lead. Now, a spot of sight seeing anyone? Should we go to the cavern? Oh, why not? <laughs>